Claire Guiraud uh, will be the moderator of our event today. And as you can see, it, I'm the uh, working as representative at the permanent representation of CAP to the UN in Geneva. So just some practical information uh, just to start. So as you can maybe see it, the event is available in three languages, uh, English, Spanish and French. So if you want to select uh, your language, you just have to click on the interpretation icon, which is the small globe at the bottom of your screen, and then you'll be able to hear your language. And thank you very much to the interpreters for the amazing work that they are going to do for us today. Also know that the event is recorded and the replay will be disseminated afterwards. And also, if time permits it, we would like to have a question and answer sessions. So please share your questions uh, in the Q&A, and I will uh, reflect the question orally to the panelists uh, later on. So before leaving uh, the floor to our distinguished panelists, I would like to say a few words uh, about CAP International for, the one, for those of you uh, who don't know us. So called CAP is a Coalition for the Abolition of Prostitution. And it's a coalition that is gathering 35 organizations in 27 countries, organizations that are providing uh, direct support services to persons in prostitution. And those organizations are gathered with a common objectives, uh, the abolition of the system of prostitution, with the strong conviction that this is key to achieve gender equality and equality for every woman and girls. So we are very happy to have this event today uh, in the scope of the UN CSW, an event that is co-sponsored by France, Sweden, and the OSC ODIR. So we can just imagine being in New York, overlooking the Hudson River, and making abolitionism resonate in this uh, key place for the negotiation of standards uh, among member states. So why have we chosen to discuss prostitution and decent work uh, today? First, because maybe you know that the review theme of the CSW this year is uh, women's economic empowerment in the changing world of work, but also because this is uh, a central, a key issue in the debate about the best ways to eliminate sexual exploitation that traps every year 20 million of persons in the world 98% of them being women and girls, and most of them coming, as you know, from the most discriminated uh, communities. And despite the fact that we have very strong testimonies of survivors, uh, and also very fact-based researches teaches us how harmful the prostitution is, and despite the fact that international standards are very clear on the compatibility between prostitution and uh, human dignity and decent work. We have the 1949 convention, the CEDO convention, the Palermo protocol, and also extensive international uh, standards of labor law uh, to, that promote decent work and that forbid sexual harassment in the workplace. But yet some people, some organizations, and even some states believe that legalizing or decriminalizing prostitution, fully decriminalizing prostitution, could be a way to eliminate it, considering that prostitution could be a choice and even a work. So that's why they call prostitution sex work, which is a terminology that we at CAP don't agree with. So this is why we have developed also a specific campaign uh, mobilizing trade unions uh, for this idea to promote decent work and not sex work. And we have already gathered uh, dozens of trade unions representing more than 10 millions of workers. And so we have three representatives of this campaign with us uh, today. And we will be also publishing video statement from five others uh, just right after this event from representative of unions in India, Canada, Ireland, Norway, and Lebanon. And also if there are unions in the audience or if you know unions that could be interesting, please uh, reach out to us uh, so that we can discuss this uh, further. So to elaborate on this topic, uh, we have gathered today experts with the representative of frontline organizations and survivors, representatives of trade unions and member states to bring their perspectives on the best practices to eliminate sexual exploitation and to promote decent work. So on behalf, on behalf of CAP, we would like to thank you, each of you distinguished panelists for your support, your availability, and also willingness to participate to these efforts. 
I will introduce the speakers uh, in the order they will speak. And I will please ask them to stick as much as possible to the timing that we have uh, agreed. Um, I will now leave the floor to our two ambassadors representing Sweden and France. So thanks again for uh, sponsoring this event. We are very grateful to be able to count on you again three years after uh, France and Sweden have developed a common strategy of, for combating human trafficking. And we we'll start right now with uh, Ambassador Anna Ekstedt, Ambassador at Large for Combating Trafficking in Persons of Sweden. Thanks again very much, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Claire. And uh, dear uh, fellow panelists and distinguished participants to this event, I'm happy to be here and I will share some of the Swedish experiences in addressing exploitation in prostitution and trafficking for sexual exploitation. Uh, I also want to thank CAP especially for the invitation and also for France and the OEC ODEAR to co-organize this event together with us. Uh, as you are aware, the work against prostitution with a focus uh, on targeting the demand and trafficking for sexual exploitation is a high priority issue for the Swedish government and it's addressed and also included in the work to combat men's violence against women. And the work is also further an integral part of the Swedish feminist foreign policy. Prostitution and human trafficking for sexual purposes is a ruthless and cynical exploitation of other people. It is a serious violation of the individual's human value and the right to decide over his or her own life. It is also a major obstacle to social equality, gender equality, and the opportunity to joy, uh, enjoy human rights. Uh, in order to end uh, exploitation in prostitution and also trafficking for sexual exploitation, we need to address the core root cause of these, this exploitation, namely the demand. We need to acknowledge that sexual exploitation and trafficking exist due to the fact that someone, namely the demand, is paying for it. The Swedish model, which is now more and more being referred to as uh, the equality model uh, comes from the fact that we've had the legislation legislation since 1999 uh, against the purchase of sexual services and we've had this le legislation in order to change no change norms in society and also stop all forms of exploitation and uh, we had a session yesterday a csv 66 session together with israel on the equality model where we presented the the work of Sweden and Israel and our respective legislation. And we also have UN Women, UNODC, the OSCE, and also survivor leaders, leaders with us in the, in the event to talk about the importance to address the demand and the fact that all member states, all states uh, that have signed the UN protocol to suppress trafficking have an obligation to address the demand independent of national legislation. Sweden has an abolitionist approach uh, to trafficking, uh, to prostitution, and uh, Swedish, the Swedish view is that prostitution causes harm both to the individuals involved and to society at large, and not least does it affect gender equality negatively. As we are aware, prostitution is a highly gendered issue. Men are the predominant purchasers of sexual services, users of victims, whether that services be provided by women, girls, LGBTI people, men or boys. And most people in prostitution are women. And I think it's uh, this session that we have here today and the fact that we're discussing this is now even more pertinent due to the uh, aggressive Russian invasion in Ukraine, where we also now have uh, people from Ukraine being uh, at risk of trafficking and also being further exploited in prostitution in Europe today. So we also have to be vigilant to make sure that children and women are not being exploited for trafficking for different purposes, but also for sexual exploitation and in prostitution. So I think this is a very important topic that we're discussing this now. But by exclusively targeting the demand, Sweden aims at disrupting the market while at the same time equalizing an inherent power imbalance between men and women. And this exploitation, uh, people in prostitution need uh, solid exit strategies, support and right to alternative livelihoods. 
and regulating and normalizing this exploitation as sex work is not an option. But of course, a ban that we have in Sweden for the buying of sexual services can only be a complement to social efforts. We need to have uh, social efforts present. And we also need to work very much with changing norms in society. We've seen in Sweden since we had this legislation since 99 that it ha it's had a normative effect in society. And there is also a strong support uh, in amongst the general population of the legislation. But we currently, we always need to remind and work with changing norms and also including men and boys in the work to uh, address the causes of violence, address the causes of the address the demand and talk about social negative social and gender stereotypes that is causing uh, uh, exploitation in prostitution and trafficking. And for example, Sweden has also included this. Uh, the government has changed the school curricula for the com for the comprehensive sexuality education in schools in order to equip men, uh, boys and girls with the understanding that sex should be based on consent and free will. So universal prevention measures are indeed uh, needed. It's positive to see that several other countries have followed suit with Sweden and that we have more countries in the world now that is implementing this model and of course we're working very closely with France and you will soon hear from my from my French colleagues, uh, what we're also implementing different activities together, which is very important. And in this work, I think it's very important that you also mentioned, Claire, the fact that we need to listen to victims, hear their voices, survivors' voices, and their recommendations on the policy that we should and guide us in policy. Sorry, I have an alarm here. Just need to check. It's okay. Um, and just just to, I think I need to end because <laughs> there, there's an alarm going on. Sorry for this. Uh, but just on terminology, I need to say something that Sweden works for common understanding and consensus on the terminology that is based on human rights, uh, based on the UNTOC and also the CEDAW convention, and also generally assembly agreed language that we have to respect internationally agreed language and and, uh, uh, and terminology in order to make sure that we are protecting the most vulnerable groups. And sex work is not mentioned in any international instrument and very few countries have also legalized prostitution as work. Sex work does not reflect on the abuse and exploitation of people in prostitution and the fact that a high number of victims are trafficking. Sweden opposes the use of this terminology that normalizes prostitution as work and that also supports legalization or even decriminalization of the whole industry. We need to decriminalize people in prostitution, of course, but not decriminalizing the buyers. And Sweden, we prefer to use the terminology people in prostitution that is inclusive and not condemning and also not sort of taking a blind eye to the fact that many people in prostitution want to leave prostitution and are also potentially victims of trafficking. Thank you so much. I'm really sorry, but now I have to leave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, for uh, providing us uh, your perspective with the example of the Swedish model. And I, I don't know if this alert, alert, alarm, I don't know, maybe is a call uh, for abolition. Um, it was also very important that you highlighted the fact that uh, Sweden does not uh, recognize the terminology of sex work and that you are fully committed to defend and promote uh, a, this agreed language uh, in the international arena. It's really important for us. So I will now leave the floor to your French counterpart, Ambassador Jean-Claude Brunet, uh, Ambassador at large against transnational criminal threats of France. Uh, merci beaucoup d'être avec nous aujourd'hui et je vous laisse la parole. Thank you for being with us today. So I leave you the floor. Merci beaucoup, euh, Excellence, euh, chers euh, collègues euh, et euh, mesdames et messieurs. Euh, je me réjouis de participer à, à cet échange aujourd'hui. Et comme euh, ma collègue de la Suède euh, et tous les autres panélistes, je voudrais euh, vraiment remercier Cap International 
euh, avec le soutien des, des missions et, et des autres organisations partenaires euh, d'avoir organisé cet échange sur un, un sujet extrêmement euh, important et d'action euh, urgente euh, pour euh, euh, défendre euh, les victimes de, de cette activité criminelle. Euh, et je It's me very urgent to defend this topic and participating with the organizations with uh, CSW and for the messages that we are carrying, my uh, Swedish colleague and myself and the ministers, now so that we can underscore what you mentioned, Claire, in terms of the implications of this criminal activity and the need to protect the victims and those who will speak out about their situations and their experience. And this gives us a, a message and it gives us a, the energy to be able to commit and to act. And, and as our colleague mentioned, the issues related to, and I expect they are related to uh, the Ukraine and the European commissioner has uh, extended our concern and how upset we have all been over the last few weeks, about half of the refugees coming through our minors. And so these underage uh, children are not uh, accompanied, they're on their own. So uh, it could be sexual uh, exploitation or forced labor. This is a real threat for these refugees. And not only in this region, unfortunately, but it's the risk in many uh, migration situations where people are in a fragile situation where they're vulnerable. And so criminal networks uh, treat human beings and use human beings and take advantage of these populations for their uh, unfortunate uh, uh, criminal activity that is sadly very profitable. So these uh, issues that the abolitionist model, France and Sweden uh, and many other countries follow along. Um, and this within the framework for France, and that's under uh, April 13, 2016, legis uh, 2016 legislation to reinforce the people in prostitution, the, the laws governing people in prostitution and the interministerial strategy in France to fight against trafficking. So it's a national action plan to fight against human trafficking headed up by an interministerial division and the European Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which I represent, provides our support and cooperation in the partner regions, be it in Africa, Southeast Europe, but we also want to defend in a multilateral sense, as we are doing today, working with CS, working in the CSW, and we want to help the legislative models that will provide solutions. And the uh, Jean-Yves Le Drian, the, um, and Marco Smarstrom uh, met on the 8th of March for the International uh, Women's Rights Day, launched this common tribune and the common strategy the French and Swedish uh, common initiative to pr promote actions to fight against uh, sexual exploitation uh, crossing uh, across the world where two thirds of the victims are women and children. So this is through feminist diplomacy and defending uh, men and women's equality and protection of victims for their protecting their dignity and their fundamental rights and the combat against exploit the exploiting these people and criminal networks so exploiting women and children women and young girls that this is where where we have inscribed our common strategy specifically uh, across this uh, feminist diplomacy as my colleague mentioned we are developing actions, promotions of the abolitionist model, also broader 
policy uh, combating uh, sex exploitation bilaterally, regionally, multilaterally, uh, specifically, and particularly, as was already mentioned, to ensure uh, the consistency of the actions and language, because it's true, figures are the figures, the numbers are very clear. I mentioned the victims, specifically women and young girls, but another figure has to be taken into consideration. It's the fact that over 60% across the world, this is a worldwide study, and it's on the upswing, over 60%, between 60 and 70% uh, on average in the world, the victims, I'm sorry, uh, the prostituted are victims of a tra human trafficking and criminal networks. In many countries, just even in like mine in France, the figure is more like 90%. And that explains, that's one of the reasons why we're moving to the abolitionist model, because the reality of prostitution is that it's 90% of these people are victim of the networks and they're increasingly violent, uh, reaching increasingly vulnerable victims. Again, 70%, 70%, and I believe 80% are foreign, uh, are foreign origin. The prostituted are foreign origin. They're recruited, exploited by networks through in an immigration setting, first of all, lured by immigration, refugees, and so on. So where the psychological hold uh, on them and the material obviously hold on them and the violence perpetrated against them is on an, a staggering increase and it's unacceptable. There is no respect of their basic human rights and it's a reality that has led us to make that step. And I would like to also point out that there's feedback because since 2016, of course, Sweden has a longer, uh, much more extensive feedback than we do, and a lot of work there, but it's been about six years now here that uh, the law has been enforced in France. And as I was saying, it's a legislation like in Sweden that there's an extension of the scope of action aiming, it's got, it's actually it's got the three objectives, three goals, first of all, to prevent and raise awareness amongst uh, citizens as regards the demand. And that's uh, slated for in the protocol of the uh, United Nations Charter for human regarding human trafficking. So raising awareness amongst citizens, decreasing demand, fining uh, uh, sex buyers, raising awareness, education in the uh, school settings and the educational systems. The other goal of the law is to uh, prosecute the sex buyers, not decriminalizing prostitution itself, but in increasing pressure on the criminal networks. There are 20 networks have been that have been dismantled in France. So the first, another one of the first three goals is to protect and support victims and provide them an exit uh, of the uh, prostitution system. And that's different from the previous models the other abolitionist uh, countries, there's a very important part and component of the French law, which is with a very positive feedback on that. Since the implementation, um, since the enforcement of the law, we've had about 450 victims who've benefited from the exit program that's organized on a departmental level with the various um, divisions, the various services that helps them get out of the prostitutional system and giving them other opportunities for employment for decent work. And it's a real success because these, amongst these people, 85% of them maintain their new jobs, their decent work and conditions that they were able to obtain. And that's since 2016 and the beginning of the implementation of that law. Now, regarding actions against the sex buyers, there's some interesting effects. There's a deterrent effect uh, in, on public streets that's um, been in place since then, since 2016, and very few recidive uh, instances. So these are signs that are very positive, 
So the implementation of the law is having some effect. It's recent, it's new, but it's worth pointing out that there's a survey in the public opinion that shows that the public supports at 78%. Um, they present, they, the public approves of the this law and the approach. That's what I wanted to say uh, in addition to my colleague, uh, Ambassador Anna Ekstedt, but I also wanted to point out the importance of the law and the abolitionist model in connection with the decent work and the world of labor. You have 90% of the prostituted people in prostitution that are victims of uh, increasingly violent organized crime networks. It's unacceptable exploitation as regards our fundamental rights without the possibility of recognizing that work as normal work. And that's the utmost priority with forced labor, child labor, as that's part of the French policy to fight against that. But human trafficking for sex exploitation is a part of the main priorities to amongst fighting organized crime, but of course, protecting victims of the violation of their dignity. And I would like to, and it's totally natural for us to protect the population. And for them, it's also important to hold the sex buyers accountable to reduce, we need to reduce demand and to be effective in combating um, sex trafficking, human trafficking. Now back to human trafficking specifically, we're, we've seen uh, testimonials for this and I want you to know that we are fully committed to, uh, um, to bring about justice for the suffering that people have been through. And we want to make the situation change and turn the trend around that are too uh, easy on organized crime and make and the situation is too easy for uh, organized criminals. So we want to be able to combat that more effectively, uh, the, the perpetrators of these crimes. So thank you very much. Thank you, CAP International. And I'm very happy to participate in these exchanges. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for your presentation, which um, sheds a lot of light on the very positive impact of the law that was passed in 2016 in terms of representation and reality of uh, people in um, prost in uh, prostitution prostitution system, and um, it's very encouraging to know the people who have who were able to exit. Presentation of the legislation in France and Sweden, also for the cooperation that you are uh, implementing together uh, um, to also influence other member states and with a specific focus on this question of consistency on the terminology and language compared to the UN agreed language. So this is a really uh, strong commitment that is very important for us. Thank you again. And I will now uh, launch our first panel, uh, Reality and Consequences of Prostitution, an Antithesis of Decent Work. So at CAP uh, International, we strongly believe that listening to experts such as um, representative of frontline organizations and survivors is really key to understand what prostitution is and to identify the best ways to eliminate it. So we are very grateful to the three advocates leader that we have with us today, Diane Martin, Ezwea Gettys and Flora Whitfield. And we are going to start with Ms. Diane Martin from Scotland. Uh, Diane Martin is vice chair of the International Survivors of Trafficking Advisory Council of the OSC ODIR. And also, I want to share with you that uh, OSC ODIR is co-sponsoring this event today, and we are very grateful for that. Uh, Diane Martin has spent over 25 years supporting women to exit commercial sexual exploitation, including 15 years as a founder and director of a specialist service for women involved in or exited from prostitution and developing a wide range of services. Thanks a lot for being here with us today, and over to you. 
Um, thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, I'm delighted to be with you all today. Uh, greetings from Scotland. Um, I just got a bit choked up because <clears throat> not good timing when you're just about to speak, but I've just seen in the chat that there are 20 prostitution survivor leaders <clears throat> joining us from the Philippines. Um, and that, yeah, that's just really exciting to know that you're with us today. <clears throat> so prostitution, is it sex and is it work? Sex. Yes, sex acts are involved, but it is unwanted sex, which means it's exploitative. Money can't buy consent, and we can't consent to our own exploitation. As for work, those with a vested interest in it often present it as being about labor rights. If we could just get that right, then all would be well. But no, we see that in countries who've tried to achieve this, that it has been an utter failure with a very real and unacceptable human cost. Prostitution is not about labor rights, but it is about human rights and the right not to be for sale. Language is important and we know that when we change the language we use to describe things, it changes how we perceive them. It's the same with prostitution. The narrative of sex work and a job like any other does exactly that. Pushing an agenda of legalization or full decriminalization seeks to reframe the sex industry where prostituted women are just service providers, punters are clients, and pimps and traffickers become managers and facilitators. And if it is accepted as a job like any other, and policy and legislation is subsequently based on this assertion, then why would we need the support systems and exiting services that we know are needed to help women leave and recover. Julie Bindle, the journalist and women's rights campaigner, rightly states that, and I quote, the inside of a woman's body is not a workplace. And Dana Levy, an Israeli survivor of prostitution, makes the point that in areas of legitimate and what we internationally describe as decent work, expertise is valued and the experienced worker can, for example, generally expect higher wages. She highlights that this is not the case in prostitution, where she says, experience has no value and a lack of experience brings in more profit for pimps and traffickers and where the common request from punters is about who is the youngest on offer and if they have new girls. I remember all too well being asked by punters at age 19 to pretend and say out loud to them that I was 16 years old. Levy also exposes the reality that, and I quote, even if there is a certain amount of labor and actual service, it is not a prerequisite for the deal. The minimum condition is only that you have a body temperature. You can be drugged or drunk to the point of unconsciousness and you can still be sold. You might participate, but you don't have to. Your body can be used for sexual acts even without your cooperation. And if this supposed work is so empowering and lucrative, we would expect to see men and women from all spheres of life queuing up for their liberation and path to riches and independence. But no, we all know the reality is that you cannot reframe and sanitize abuse and exploitation. And we all already know that nobody, including those who espouse the sex workers work mantra, wants their daughter subjected to this supposed work. But if this is work, who is sought out to do this supposed work? What are the qualifications, the recruitment process, the training, the occupational hazards? Prostitution, as we've heard, is highly gendered, where the overwhelming majority forced, recruited, groomed, or trapped there by others or by desperate circumstances are women and children overwhelmingly poor from already disadvantaged and marginalized groups and overwhelmingly women of color. In prostitution, women are objects treated like a commodity to be consumed and discarded. In prostitution, there are nearly always underlying issues that create the conditions of vulnerability. Most women and girls' routes into prostitution have been paved with these issues, including poverty, childhood sexual abuse, neglect, addiction, or coercive and controlling relationships. 
This is why we must rid ourselves of the false dichotomy we're continually presented with, that of course, sex trafficking is bad, but prostitution is a choice and a job. Both rely on gender inequality and vulnerability. Both are inherently harmful. But these vulnerabilities are not the cause or the root of prostitution. For that, we need to shift our focus and ask, who creates the demand for this supposed work? Sex buyers create this demand for a subset of women to be exploited. It's entitled men of every social class, education and economic status who make the choice to exploit by renting the bodies of women. If there was no demand, there would be no supply. And who benefits from this supposed work? It's all about profit and financial gain, but not for those subjected to it. Sex buyers line the pockets of pimps, traffickers, and organized crime groups who are raking in billions off the literal backs of women and children. My professional experience has meant years of work supporting women exploited through street-based prostitution to exit and recover. In my late teens, I was exploited through prostitution in London and later trafficked to a prostitution ring abroad. Ridiculously described as high class, I was sent out by what was described as the safest agency in London. There is nothing high class about being raped, bitten or asked at gunpoint if you want to see your mum again. The venues for me were luxury hotels, apartments and diplomatic accommodation. The punters highly educated and in positions of power. Trafficked overseas, the venues were royal palaces and the homes of government ministers. It is all the same thing. A bruise or a threat feels the same whether you're in a five-star hotel or leant against a car park wall. The fear, the violence and the hopelessness feels the same as does the desire for safety and a life free of violence. Please believe those of us who've been on the receiving end of this supposed sex, know that it's unwanted and that it makes it abuse. To those of you who thought your money paid for consent, we did not want you touching us. It made our skin crawl. We did not want to touch your body. We were all either faking it or past being able to fake it and you did not care whether you deluded yourself by our fake smiles, our hollow sounds of pretend pleasure, or whether you saw our distress, ignored it, or were sexually gratified by it and did what you wanted to anyway. Know that our thoughts were about wondering if we would get out in one piece and that as soon as we could, we tried to scrub off all traces of you. If only we could wash off the memories as easily and some of us have spent years trying to do just that. And if this work, this supposed job is just this, it's the same old expo exploitation and violence visited on the bodies of the world's most vulnerable women and children, day in, day out, exploitation and violence should never be privatized. It should be exposed and those inflicting the harm, those creating the conditions for it to flourish and those who profit from it should be criminalized and held accountable. How long are survivors going to have to be saying the same thing, fighting the same fight, pleading with governments and those with power and authority? Well, the answer is as long as we have to. It can be exhausting and there is a cost to it, but we will do it because we know the much larger cost is being paid right now by those still exploited, right now by those being broomed and right now by those who've managed to get away but don't know how to start to recover and rebuild their lives. As individuals, we have a duty not to turn away, but to turn towards and face the realities of prostitution, to see and to name this violent exploitation for what it is. And as states, we must enact the international agreements and obligations we've already signed up to. In conclusion, I know that all of you here today on the panel and listening at home or your workplace want to make a difference. As Archbishop Desmond Tutu stated, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. So what is your sphere of influence? What is your expertise? What can you do? A good starting point is to thoroughly examine the reality of prostitution, which is unwanted sex, violence and exploitation. Prostitution, neither sex nor work. 
Thank you, and I'll now hand back to the chair. Thank you so much, uh, Diane. It was a uh, really moving, really powerful, uh, and very, very strong. Uh, I totally agree with you. And also I want to say uh, hi to the other survivors who have joined us uh, today. And thank you so much. You said it all, actually. Um, the reality of what is prostitution, the fact that we have to see it, to name it properly also. And of course, that we have to fight it. So I think uh, your call for action, I hope your call for action will be heard um, in a broader uh, audience also that uh, this event, I'm sure it, it will be. Uh, thank you so much. And I will now leave the floor to Ezoe Agatiz, uh, founder and executive director of Iroko Onlus, uh, which is based both in Italy and Nigeria. We are very proud to count Iroko as our cap member uh, in Italy. Iroko provides direct services to victims of trafficking to establish independent and dignified life. So Edwe, thank you very much for being with us today and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, distinguished guests and uh, members of um, uh, and other panelists. Um, thank you so much, Diane, for that um, extremely impactful um, presentation that has touched quite a lot of the things that we see in our work. Uh, we work with victims of sex trafficking predominantly and also with victims of sexual violence. And what we have learned is that when people, when women end up in the prostitution industry, it's because they don't have a choice. There's nothing about choice in the prostitution industry. When you find that women are economically, politically and socially advanced and they have access to um, good life, they have access to the basic needs of life. They do not make that so-called choice to go into prostitution. Prostitution is linked to situations of vulnerability and the overwhelming majority, and we are talking about at least, at the very least 99% of those who are in the prostitution industry end up there, not out of choice, but out of the lack of an alternative out of the lack of a possibility for them to have a life, for them to access work. Prostitution is not work. So there's even, not even a question of describing it as indecent. It is not work, it is violence. And from the evidence we've had, from those who know, from those who've had that experience, we know that it is violence. We know that from research that has been carried out in different parts of the world, Prostituted women are at least 40% more at risk of dying violently than normal people, than uh, uh, people in normal life who don't uh, have that kind of experience. I'm not saying that they are not normal people. I'm saying that they go through some extremely difficult situations because they have no choice because they end up in that kind of situation. And so we are working very hard to bring in the abolitionist um, uh, policies, both in Italy and in Nigeria. And working as members of uh, CAP, we have been able to bring together a lot of the abolitionist organizations in Italy. We have created the uh, Italian Abolitionist Network. We are working with members of the Italian parliament to ensure that the abolitionist law is brought also to Italy and happily, with a draft bill was recently submitted by the uh, member of parliament, the senator that we are working with. In Nigeria, we're also working, trying to bring that kind of situation also in Nigeria, although it's still at the beginning, to ensure that the Nigerian government would also look at protecting its people by refusing to allow prostitution, a violent uh, uh, um, activity to be seen as work or to be passed um, into law as work. And that is part of the work that we as um, Iroko, we, we've been doing. I would like to also touch on um, the way that in recent times, prostitution has been considered, especially in a very important decision of the Italian uh, Constitutional Court in March of 2019. According to the court, uh, abolitionist principles are what should be installed in all countries to counter the violence of prostitution. And the court recognized the fact that um, the person who sells sexual services is potentially a victim. 
and the aggressor, the court recognized society as the aggressor. And so it's asked ask the, the, the state not to be a part of that, uh, of the sex industry that puts half of its population on sale to the other half. And the court also recognized the fact that entry into the circuit of prostitution is extremely difficult to exit that due to pressure, due to blackmail, due to physical violence, due to the compulsion to undergo unwanted sexual acts and contagion resulting from unprotected sexual in intercourse. We had the very, very uh, impactful and, imp and, and you know, important uh, intervention of Diane earlier, where she spoke about all of what is involved in what people want to make us believe is work. And the court said, even in times where we say it is not forced uh, prostitution, the choice, so-called choice to sell sex finds its root in the vast majority of cases uh, uh, in factors that condition and limit the freedom of self-determination of the individual. And so the legislature needs to recognize that prostitution cannot be considered work because of the basis on which it starts off. We know that sex trafficking is the end product of prostitution. Sex trafficking cannot exist if prostitution does not exist. So we cannot on one hand talk about eliminating sex trafficking while at the same time we are promoting uh, prostitution as, as a job, prostitution as employment. It cannot be because there are two sides of the same coin. One is exists as a result of the other. And that is why it is so important that we begin to talk about the abolitionist model. That is why it is so important that members of parliament learn more about it because what we've also found, found out is that a lot of those impositions of, of having an impact of changing the law are not really um, that well informed about what prostitution is. There is this general acceptance of the general idea of prostitution as inevitable. It is not inevitable. It's a, a little bit like the way uh, um, uh, slavery used to be. Once upon a time, slavery was seen as acceptable. That's the way that prostitution should be seen now as something that is not acceptable. In Europe, there's a lot of talk about gender equality, about the same kind of rights for men and women. But how can you have gender equality where half of the population is put on sale to the other half? So you cannot put people's body on sale and then talk about them being equal to the others. It is not possible. And so the court, or the, the uh, Italian constitutional court also said that prostitution does not give, give dignity. Prostitution is something that dehumanizes and debases the human body and so cannot be accepted as a work activity and cannot be accepted by law as something that anyone should be encouraged to enter into. And so for us in Iroko and as members of CAP, we are doing our best to ensure that this is passed into law. So please don't call it work, it is violence. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zoe, for sharing uh, your perspective analysis for also all the activities you are conducting both in Italy and Nigeria. And uh, specifically also the advocacy work you are doing and this is uh, we are really happy to hear that there are some uh, beginning of developments also in Nigeria and we know that in Italy this is quite promising so thank you very much for your commitment and I will now leave the floor to Flora Whitfield uh, who is survivor and today communication and program manager for Breaking Free. Uh, we are also very proud to count uh, Breaking Free as one of our CAP members in the US. Um, Breaking Free helps over 500 women a year to escape systems of prostitution through advocacy, direct services, housing, education. And Flora will, let, uh, will, uh, will tell us more about that. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Awesome. Hello, my name is Flora Woodfield and thank you for the introduction. And I wanna say thank you to Ms. Diane for the uh, presentation and the presenter that just presented as well. And um, <clears throat> here at Breaking Free, we um, have been serving the community since 1996. And we are a nonprofit organization. 
and we're serving individuals escaping systems of commercial sexual exploitation, prostitution, and sex trafficking by providing direct services, permanent supportive housing, and support groups and advocacy by addressing the, the demand, we have seen a tremendous impact within our community. Sex work, prostitution, or anything of that nature is not considered a is not considered real work. And what I mean by that, it's not a credible profession. It's an oppression of any any individual that is being affected by by this. And <clears throat> well, let's look at it like this. For instance, what professional setting have you known of? that is inflicted by prolonged, cruel, or unjust treatment? Probably not many. So the reality of this being considered appropriate or decent work is a total lie. The deception of, of the sex industry and sex work being sex positive is a false advertisement of what the realities are that these individuals suffer through every day and for those who have been traumatized by this in the past. It is unfair. It is unfair for anyone to project the false implications of what these individuals face each and every day. Rather, if it's survival, <clears throat> this is still not a choice. No one chooses prostitution. It's a lack of choices, a lack of barriers that are created <clears throat> in this vicious cycle of exploitation, manipulation, and deception. There is nothing glamorous or empowering by the fact that a person is being objectified and being used as a commodity for the sake of someone else's sexual pleasures. This is a choiceless choice. No one chooses to be used and abused. And I don't care how much money an individual is making for the simple fact that is, if the money was not there, she or he would not be there. It's paid rape. It's simply put, <clears throat> no women and girls want to be prostituted or be bamboozled into this false sense of real what has been sold to them. No one wants to be objectified for someone else's sexual use rather than seen as a person with the independence to make their own decision making. That is not empowering. Sex work is not empowering. Set sites like OnlyFans is they're encouraging and normalizing young women and girls to commodify themselves, which places them in the mindset to view themselves as objects, which can then be exchanged for money and goods. That is a clear example of sexual objectification. When we start to live in the mindset, it can cancel out all the other qualities that we have, which sets us apart from the rest of our society and communities and our families and friends. So we may begin to isolate, self-medicate, self-sabotage, self-destruct, and because there is no way anyone can endure being used and abused over and over and manipulated to and lied to, that makes you feel unhuman. And <clears throat> that creates a huge barrier within internally and externally and creates isolation and pain among many other barriers. We can't openly discuss how great our jobs are when we are in the life or how fantastic the benefits are or how about taking our children to work. That's not a thing because it's not a legit job. It's not work. It's violence against women and no one should be bought and sold. We are not items. There is nothing empowering about that. Sexuality versus sexualization. Now let's take a moment to think about how society has promoted the over-sexualization of young women and girls, which promotes them to express themselves sexually in an unhealthy manner. Adapting to what has been normalized pushes us to focus on the aspects we see. A person's values comes from only, comes from only their sexual appeal or behavior, which excludes her from all her other amazing characteristics. Basically, to me, this means that a woman has been valued based on her beauty, external appearance, being over-sexualized, and, and also the behaviors that come along with it. This has been glorified in the media and all social media platforms. If you take a look, if you take a second and scroll through your phone, I'm pretty sure you'll see apps like TikTok and Facebook, and you'll discover that women and young girls are being overly sexualized in videos and photos, even targeted young girls and boys. The number one search topic on pornography sites is teens, tweens, young girls. This is an alarming issue. The porn industry is having a huge impact on today's dating and healthy sex and healthy relationships. Young uh, women and girls have been sexualized and this is not empowering. <clears throat> it's not empowering to see that they are not being empowered with, on their beauties and their intelligence and not being taught to utilize their transferable skills. 
For me, this is problematic and not empowering. Here is a quote from a survivor. Every time I would post something on my OnlyFans page that they would say, that's good, but it's not enough. And I felt that I had to keep getting more and more extreme. And I kept telling myself I was empowered only to pretend that I would smile in, in those pictures, but I wasn't happy. Things, and I was doing things like a robot. Personally, I can agree with that. Does that sound empowering to you? In today's generation, the sexualization of women has been trending. Some people may even agree that sites like OnlyFans or porn sites exporting and work, sex work, et cetera, is sexual liberation. The birth of sexual liberation began in 1986. That is not what that was designed for. It was designed for women to freely express their needs without judgment, but not in the way to be sold as objects. The recruitment, grooming, and facilitating of and, and enslavement of individuals in this lifestyle creates a lifelong healing process that is a dehumanizing and is nothing professional about it. If you could take anything away from this event today, just know that this is not a choice. Prostitution is violence against women, and we need to be intentional about educating our children and bringing awareness and walking alongside of all of our survivors and support in any capacity that we can. My call to action is for you to get connected with all your local or national agencies and get connected with their work and collaborate, network, and get um, the stories out there. Thank you for your time, and I appreciate Cap for inviting Breaking Free out to share our experience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Flora, for uh, also your very strong testimonies uh, showing the lifelong impacts on the life of the victims, showing how it's unfair, how prostitution is unfair, how to consider it as a work is unfair, and also the link with the over-sexualization of uh, young women and girls uh, today. And thank you to the three of you. Uh, I believe that uh, your three speeches have been really appreciated. If I just can see the comments in the discussion, and I also can share uh, my appreciation because it was really uh, strong, really moving, and really inspiring. And I will. I really hope that uh, your call for action will be heard uh, widely. So I'll now launch our uh, second panel, uh, the concept of sex work, a violation of the rights of all women workers with representatives of three trade unions. So of course, trade unions are key stakeholders for social justice and against all forms of exploitation. So they're really key in this debate on why prostitution cannot be considered as a work. So we are very grateful to the three unions uh, who joined our efforts today, the French CGT, Confédération Générale du Travail, uh, Centro in the Philippines, and IUF Asia Pacific, who were among the first who have joined our campaign that aims at mobilizing uh, trade unions to promote decent work. And we will start right now with uh, Sabine Renoza, who is representative of the French Union CGT and member of the working group uh, of Femme Mixité. Uh, you were already with us two days ago in Madrid for a very important event at the Spanish Parliament, and you are again with us today. So thank you very much for your uh, dedication and your availability, your support, and the floor is yours. Oui, tout à fait bien. Je vous remercie uh, pour cette. Thank cette you invitation. very much for the invitation. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Hello to everyone. Since you mentioned Spain. I will start by pointing at, oh, interpreter apologize. She is cutting out penalization of all types of the abolition of prostitution that fits with the electoral uh, and commitments by the majority party. Now, to come to my trade union, the CGT. Yes, I wanted to sum up our abolitionist commitment. Uh, it's essentially two facts. First of all, it's a struggle against all forms of exploitation, a, a struggle that uh, the theorization of the roles and functions are different from men and women. It uh, closes them into hierarchical identities. In this case, the idea that women are objects at the service of men's desires is the basis of sexist and sexual violence in and out of work. And this can only perpetuate gender inequalities, as was already uh, mentioned. So this uh, abolitionist uh, 
position displayed by the CGT since 2013 was the only one possible in line with the principles and values we defend as a trade union organization in line with the United Nations Convention for the Suppression of Traffic in Persons ratified by France in 1960. Finally, it is in conformity with the French Civil Code, which is, establishes that the human body is inviolable and that it is forbidden to commercialize it. Thus, in France, there is a consensus on the prohibition of the sale of organs. This stems from the more general principle of safeguarding the dignity of people, which has constitutional value and is opposed to the law of the market. This is the basis of the prohibition of slavery. A project for society cannot be built on the sum of a few individual consents, especially when these consents go against fundamental principles. The liberal these questions, in fact, are of an ethical nature, but also legal in terms of social law. Our position is also in line with the interests of employees who benefit from rules that protect the most vulnerable and build a common life project. As a trade union organization, we must defend the standards conquered through struggles regarding decent work. And we cannot derogate from the reference criteria adopted by the ILO, but let's look at the reality of prostitution. Let's listen to the stories of survivors. Let's look at the figures. Let's confront them with the arguments of the prostitution lobby. A worker sells work time. She sells labor power. She does not sell her body or her intimacy. To claim that one can rent one's body uh, is tantamount to equating crime of rape with a simple assault. Prostitution, the human body is made available. It's a very object of service. Violence and abuse are inherent to it and become an extension of professional competence. In the employment relationship, the employee is subordinate to the employer. That is true. He or she must obey the directives and do the work required, of course. But the employer does not have all rights. It's true that the body is mobilized in the work activity. It's true that it is often mistreated, but this is the effect of the execution of the work. It is not the objective. Social legislation imposes limits on the relationship with subordination, as well as obligations regarding health work, health and safety at work. To admit that a client, quote unquote, can come to possess a human body opens a breach in this conception and questions the very, very notion of a work relationship. This weakens all labor legislation and not, not only for women. What is sold to us as a progressive, quote unquote, conception is the supreme stage of capitalism, a capitalism that seeks to impose itself in all dimensions of our lives, leading us to apprehend our bodies and minds as mere raw materials. The ultra liberal ideology of prostitution is based on the myth of consent which is based on the fiction of an egalitarian relationship between prostitute and prostituted. As trade unionists, we see every day what a person in a situation of vulnerability and or economic dependence is willing to accept in order to survive. To, as soon as a person in a situation of power exerts coercion, violence, domination, or exploitation of any kind on another, Consent is biased. The protection of the exploited person is necessary and the sanction of the oppressor is legitimate. Hence, also the prohibition of sexual har harassment. Europe and many countries around the world have created legislation that prohi prohibits in the workplace and in society in general, forcing a sexual act in any way, shape or form in exchange for anything. This is called sexual harassment. And the latest convention adopted almost unanimously at the ILO extends and strengthens the protections. By what artifice of language does the regulation of prostitution manage to, de to define an outlaw territory where men could continue to have access to the bodies of the most precarious women? For the recourse to prostitution requires by definition the solicitation of an act of sexual nature. Therefore, recognizing prostitution as a legal activity blurs the line between sexual harassment and solicitation of a person in the context of a so-called economic activity, quote unquote. This makes it even more difficult for victims to be recognized as such. To speak of sex workers' rights is a euphemism for the rights of pimps and prostitution consumers. It is an article of language to present this vestige of the most archaic patriarchy as modern, subversive, liberating, and even feminist. While the discourse served to the conservatives invokes a contractual relationship of private law between consenting persons, without any intervention of the society in even less of the state. The idea that prostitution is a job like any other has been used to justify the legalization of highly lucrative activities supported by so-called sex workers unions, quote unquote. All over Europe, the same model, 
with website, online activity, and impressive media presence. And of course, promotion of porn, the ideology that feeds the system. These groups do not support any demands that would go against the interests of the industry bosses. I mean, the pimps, of course. No denunciation of the working conditions, quote unquote, nor of the trafficking, nor of the brutal death of those they claim to defend. Who finances them? Who makes them live? Who keeps them alive? What are their statuses? What social conflict have they carried? The real unions that have tried to organize people in prostitution have not been successful. And for good reason. These people do not want to stay in prostitution. They don't declare themselves as such. They do not assert a professional identity, nor do they increase their skills as they gain experience in the sector. And as this was said, who would be proud to direct their daughter towards this type of opportunity? As trade unionists, it is time to take ownership of the issue and unite around an, abol an abolitionist position. The situation of women arriving from Ukraine and being picked up by uh, prostitutors makes abolition more urgent than ever, as was already mentioned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sabine, for your very powerful analysis that shows that it is not a, a working uh, agreement. There is no real consentment. The blurred line there between harassment and uh, prostitution, the these uh, so-called uh, sex workers uh, unions that are not really unions. Secretary of International Union of Food, Agricultural, Hotel, Restaurants, Catering, Tourism, Tobacco and Allied Workers Association, IUF Asia Pacific. Thank you very much for being with us today, also considering how late this is for you, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Claire. And I, I just want to start by saying that I, I uh, thank you to CAP International for inviting me to speak. As an international trade unionist, I join you today in full support of the struggle to abolish prostitution and with tremendous respect uh, for the survivors and, and solidarity to all of you. Um, it is absolutely essential that this is a trade union agenda to support this struggle, but be, to be part of the struggle and in many cases to be essential to it. Let me begin by talking about this notion of, of sex work, and, and I refer to prostitution, but let's deal with this concept of sex work in relation to decent work. First of all, I want to talk about decent work. Decent work is not a description of work being good jobs, bad jobs, decent, indecent. Decent work is about workers' aspirations and about the fulfillment of their rights. According to the ILO, this is the official definition, and I quote, decent work sums up the aspirations of people in their working lives. It involves opportunities for work that is productive and delivers a fair income, security in the workplace, and social protection for families, better prospects for personal development and social integration, freedom for people to express their concerns, organize and participate in the decisions that affect their lives, and equality of opportunity and treatment for all men and women. That is the definition of decent work, and everything that we have heard today is the opposite of that. With all of these preconditions, of decent work, regardless of how dangerous and difficult or underpaid work is, all work can become decent work, but so-called sex work cannot, because the selling of women for sexual use and exploitation cannot be considered work. The preconditions for sex work are poverty, debt, a lack of social protection, insecurity, marginalization, displacement by conflict and war and trafficking. This is what forces women into prostitution. It is compulsion, not choice. Sex work cannot become decent because the so-called sex industry needs the economic, social, and physical vulnerability of women and girls. It's part of their business model. It's a resource. And bringing an end to this vulnerability, and as, as Diane said, cutting off the demand, castrating the demand, would bring an end to the sex industry itself. To argue that prostitution is work is to argue that it is comparable to any other form of waged work. And work is selling your labor power in exchange for a wage. This mental and physical labor power produces a product or service. Yet in sex work, what is sold is not a woman's mental and physical labor power, but herself. She is the commodity. She is the product that is consumed. And this precludes all the preconditions for decent work, and it cannot be called work. 
The prostitution as an industry is allowed or encouraged to operate generating massive economic wealth, criminal profits. But the exploitation of women in this industry to create that profit is not employment. Women are not employed to provide a service selling their labor power for a wage. They are the product, as we've heard today. It is therefore not employment, but the enslavement of women and girls, reinforced by the patriarchal treatment of them as commodities, as properties. It is impossible to ensure access to rights so integral to decent work because goods, commodities, products do not have rights. And this underpins, again, this business logic of this criminal enterprise. The notion of prostitution as sex work is contingent on the claim that she has chosen this employment. It is her choice. And this ignores all of the force and compulsion we referred to earlier. The deliberate and systematic exploitation of the economic, social, and physical vulnerability of women and girls due to poverty, debt, and displacement produces force, not choice. In our work on modern slavery in the fisheries industry, we have rescued fishers from trafficking and forced labor. I have not once heard any government, company, union, or NGO suggest that he was on that boat by choice. They recognized that for reasons of poverty, debt, and displacement, he was on that boat through no choice of his own and subjected to horrendous and degrading treatment. Why do these same organizations suggest that women exploited in prostitution made a choice? And what happened to our outrage at horrendous and degrading treatment? The only way we could possibly consider that any choice occurs is certain preconditions where there's no force and compulsion that's eliminated. And what does that mean? That must mean that there is no poverty, no debt, no display, displacement, no trafficking, no forced labor, and that all of the vulnerability of women and girls is gone. And to add, as Diane said, that the, the demand is eliminated. But that means there must be social protection for all, health for all, freedom from debt. We actually have to have a comprehensive social protection system that the UN General Secretary called for in September last year and er eradicate all poverty. We have to create jobs, guarantee a living wage, and ensure that everyone has access to the universal human right to housing, education, food, and nutrition as guaranteed in the UN Declaration on Human Rights. And only then is it even possible to have a discussion about whether choices are being made. But we are so far from this condition. And now, because of this economic crisis, we face increasing and war and conflict. We face increasing poverty, debt, and displacement in the next decade. That means increased vulnerability of millions of girls and women. It means increased exploitation of women and girls in prostitution. And as the global tourism industry recovers, and you heard in the introduction that our union is also in organizing in the tourism sector, as the global tourism industry recovers with the promise of building back better, governments, resort owners, and tourism industry operators will once again encourage and promote prostitution as a tourist attraction, as entertainment. And there's no doubt that this so-called sex tourism will be a driver of foreign exchange earnings and business recovery in many countries. Women and girls will be exploited in the sex tourism. They will remain poor and kept poor because the industry needs them poor. That is how they reproduce their product through this permanent, permanent perpetual vulnerability. It is impossible to conceive that it is work and that it can be decent work. Article 23 of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights refers to the right to earn an income that ensures, quote, an existence worthy of human dignity. What happens when earning that income forci forcibly rips away your dignity and by treating you as a product, as property, as a commodity, tries to take away your humanity too? Survivors have courageously struggled to recover the human dignity by escaping trafficking and prostitution and helping others to do so. Calling prostitution sex work denigrates that courageous struggle and simply casts doubt on our own humanity and human dignity. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Idiot Greenfield, for uh, your analysis, also for recalling the international standards, uh, ILO definition of decent work and the Universal Declaration for Human Rights uh, to, for highlighting also the structural need of this industry for women and girls, vulnerable women and girls, and for poverty. And also, I really uh, find your example very enlightening, um, your comparison with uh, forced labor, and why do we question uh, the choice only in the case of sexual exploitation? So thank you very much for all that. And I will now leave the floor to Joshua Mata, who is the General Secretary of Central Union in Philippines. Thank you very much for your support and also for being here. This is also very late for you and over to you. Thank you very much, Claire, and thank you to CAP for your invitation. 
it is indeed an honor for me to be part of this event. Um, our work against prostitution in the Philippines, or particularly in my organization, Central, is part and parcel of our work for equality. We can't have real equality so long as there are those who are reduced to selling their bodies to survive. That's the starting point of Centro's perspective on this. I started working full-time for the Philippine labor movement three decades ago. It was a very macho movement. I distinctly remember the time in the early 90s when it was normal for women leaders to be heckled even before they can express their opinions during our congresses. Today, in our union, that's no longer possible. After a long struggle, women are taking over leadership roles, even in sectors that are almost entirely dominated by men, like, for example, in the informal transport sector. And they are proving to be far more better, far more committed than their male counterparts. Today, even the macho leaders among us, and I'm afraid that there are still uh, those dinosaurs with us, uh, would never dare utter a sexist joke. Uh, in, inside our organization. Now, how is this possible? Let me share several insights. First, consistent with our principles, consistent with our principles, it was the women themselves who led the way in forcing change in our movement. It was our women leaders staying the work for equality despite the overpowering machismo in our movement. Um, it, of course, it also helped that there were men who were converted to feminism. Um, I used to think, to, frankly, I used to think that uh, being a socialist would be enough to right all the wrongs in the world. Until I was invited by the Coalition Against Trafficking in Women, Asia Pacific, or CATWAP, to a young men's camp where I first encountered the gender sensitivity training to address demand of prostitution. If it was in that training where I was forced to confront my own machismo, um, and, and, uh, and it was there where I realized that transforming society will never be complete without dismantling the gender boxes created by patriarchy. This is why we adapted gender sensitivity training as part of our education ladder. We thank, uh, we thank the uh, uh, CATW Asia Pacific for exporting to us their GST module. This module includes discussion on gender sensitivity, violence against women, including prostitution, and redefining sexuality. For me, it is one of the most revolutionary trainings that we have in our education arsenal. I saw young men transformed after hearing the testimony of a survivor of prostitution on how destructive the nexus of capitalism and patriarchy is. With tears in their eyes, they apologize to the survivor in behalf of all the men who look down at women and have condoned the practice of buying women. We also incorporated this module in our efforts to organize migrant domestic workers in Hong Kong, Macau, Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, and lately Taiwan and Kuwait. Today, our migrant domestic workers organizations in these countries are actively advocating against trafficking and prostitution. But more than the module, we also owe a lot to the women survivors organized by Coalition Against Trafficking in Women Asia Pacific for continuously inspiring us. They are one of the best organizers as I've ever worked with, and a lot of them are actually here with us tonight. So kudos to all of them. Thank you, and I salute you all. Women's leadership for now, now for, for Centro, it was um, we realized early on that forming women's committees are important. But it is still important for us. But we also realized that it can be a convenient way for macho leaders to sideline women leaders and contain their voices. It's like letting the women be busy in the kitchen while decision making is actually done in the main room. This is why our women leaders emphasize not just the building of women's committees, but to create a feminist movement within the labor movement. This requires, of course, developing more women leaders who are willing and ready to take on bigger and bigger roles. This requires discussing the radical and socialist feminism. With new women leaders, Central Women is now at the forefront of our union's uh, struggle for equality. And part and parcel, as I said, it is part and parcel of our work. Um, and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and it includes the eradication of prostitution. Now, we were able to win a number of victories in terms of social policies and legislation, even as we continue to advance women's welfare at the local level. But let me focus on our work, what, what we have done so far. 
now work in prostitution. First, um, in as early as 2006, we adopted a policy on sexual harassment and anti-prostitution. In Centro, anyone proven to be buying uh, women in prostitution will be um, expelled. We campaigned among our ranks, especially among transport workers, to reject the practice. It is mandatory that this resolution is explained in all our major trainings and activities. Our migrant domestic workers union, as I had mentioned in Hong Kong and Singapore, were also able to handle cases of prostitution and sexual harassment, and not just among migrant domestic workers themselves. We have had numerous activities with survivors of prostitution, uh, thanks to CAPW as well, um, listening to them and working with them in campaigning against violence against women, especially for the passage of an anti-prostitution bill that will strengthen penalties against buyers and institutionalized support services, especially exit programs for prostituted women. Now, recently, we successfully campaigned for the passage of uh, Safe Spaces Act, which criminalizes sexual harassment. And this, even as we are contesting, we are resisting uh, an authoritarian government uh, led by Mr. Duterte. We supported a senator who passed an anti trafficking law that removed the criminalization of women victims and survivors of prostitution. But we still have a, a, we still have daunting challenges ahead. The rise of authoritarianism in our country and misogyny is threatening to, threatening to roll back the gains of the movement. Not only do we have to fight the normalization of misogyny among, women, uh, among men, we also have to engage women who buy into patriarchal values. We need to battle the persistent peddling of the idea of sex work, especially among those who are supposed to be progressives, not only in the Philippines, but even abroad. I'm a trade unionist. Our job is to make work decent. And, and um, Brother Hidayat has already clearly explained that that is not, I mean, making prostitution decent is not possible. I cannot imagine how we, I can negotiate an agreement that would make prostitution decent, when in fact, prostitution is one of the worst forms of violence against women. So long as there is patriarchy and capitalism, women will always be commodified. And that is the biggest challenge that we continue to face. Indeed, we, have ha we still have a long way to go, but I believe that our future as a movement would depend on how effectively we can institutionalize, equal institutionalize equality in our movement. In a country that's threatened to be overwhelmed by authoritarianism, the struggle for equality is as important as the struggle to deepen democracy. In both cases, we recognize that there are no shortcuts. We need to sustain the spade work of educating our ranks and mobilizing them against all forms of oppression, including prostitution. And finally, I really believe that as long as the trade union movement, the global labor movement, and all the labor movements around the, in every country would not take prostitution and sex trafficking and the fight for equality as, a, as, a, as a one of the most important struggles that we are facing, then I think it, the, the road ahead would be much, much harder for all of us. So with that, I'd like to express once again to reiterate Centro's commitment to fight alongside with you all. And I salute you all who are fighting for abolition. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Joshua, for uh, all the really important work that you are doing at Centro. I think it, uh, to the awareness raising activities uh, with this, this training is really, really interesting and could uh, maybe inspire other uh, unions and also fully agree with the uh, fact that uh, this is a deeply um, gender issue and the need to institutionalize gender equality through the organization is also key to uh, to do this uh, battle. And uh, we share also your appreciation world for CATW Asia Pacific, uh, which is a really close friend uh, of CAP. And uh, I know that there are some representatives also in the audience and uh, I give them a, a big hi. Um, I see that uh, we have very few questions actually. So I saw a very technical question that I can answer is that, uh, yeah, for some reasons, maybe some of you have uh, been confused about the timing of the event and joined quite lately. 
So be reassured, the event is uh, registered, recorded, and will be replayed on our YouTube channel very soon. So even if you've missed uh, the very powerful speeches that we've had today, you will be able to uh, catch them and uh, see you uh, them later on. And I see only one technical question, maybe that is, I think, for um, either yet, but I think that you've replied, but maybe it could be interesting to share uh, this question uh, to everyone about the activities that uh, you as union are conducting to pursue your governments to ratify the 190 Convention of ILO on gender-based violence. Maybe you would like to share uh, your answer with the audience. Oh well, yes, just just briefly that as an international, as a global union federation, the IUF uh, is. Uh, f first of all, I should say that when Convention 190 was being developed, the very first discussions, actually, uh, the Coalition Against Trafficking of Women Asia Pacific played a very important role in working with us to educate our unions and affiliates, and and to give our input about the violence against women into the whole process. Uh, before it became a convention. So once it became a convention, with unfortunately all the negotiation and compromise that happens, uh, we did, uh, with what we've got, uh, we're, we're as a global union fighting for ratification of Convention 190 and adoption of the recommendation. And then we include it in all uh, negotiations with uh, transnational companies about their commitments. Um, and uh, yes, it's very much part of our, our program. Uh, our education and our campaign and policy program. Uh, we have not made significant progress yet uh, with many countries, but of course, you know, um, uh, in the next four year Congress period, it's, it's absolutely a priority. So, so, but it does need much more education on the ground uh, in order to build support. It can't just be uh, a deal done at the top because then it'll be a very weak convention. So, so I think um, we still have to push through as, uh, with uh, a lot more education organizing and create more demand for it. And so our focus on the 25th of November every year on the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women is to get unions to take more action, to create the demand for this convention to be ratified from the ground up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I also just see a question about uh, research studies, resources on the topic. Um, so it's an opportunity also for me to let you know that uh, in a few days we will be launching our last girl first report, which is a very uh, strong and uh, fact based report highlighting the fact that uh, women and girls from the most vulnerable communities are overrepresented um, into prostitution. So you can find this online on our website uh, very soon. And also you can follow us on, the, on our social networks and you will find many resources. I don't know if maybe, I don't know, Diane, is away, anyone, Flora, want to share uh, resources to um, help people to keep uh, understanding what prostitution is? Um. Uh, I just I put in the chat um, the website of the campaign that I'm chairing in Scotland, uh, which is and you you can see it in the chat. It's www.amodelforscotland.org, um, and as well as information about the campaign, which is basically calling for the introduction of the Nordic model, uh, the equality model here in Scotland. Um, there are I think about currently four webinars that we've held since September. The first one was the launch webinar. And then there are other specific topics like ones on men who pay for sex, uh, ones on uh, pimping websites. Uh, the last one we had, uh, well, it's, it's gonna be two part. We've held one part, which is what can we learn globally from countries who have um, adopted the Nordic model. Uh, and we're, we're, good, we're trying to do um, an event every four to six weeks. Um, but if you look on that website, it's very easy to just click on the links of those webinars. And um, yeah, I hope that you find that as encouraging as uh, the ones that I, you know, access from um, many of the other organizations participating today. Thank you. Great. Is there anyone who wants to share uh, resources or? Yes, Flora. Oh, yes. Hello. I just was going to uh, say thank you, everyone. And 
I would always just refer to the human trafficking hotline if there's a need and get connected with your community agencies. Um, there is, I'm not exactly sure what that all looks like for everyone because we're in so many different places, but just um, become aware with those different agencies because they all provide different things. And the individuals that you'll be working with, as you all know, um, will have different case management needs. And it's gonna take a it's gonna take a village of us to come together and walk alongside of our survivors. That's what it took for me. Um, and so that I know that it works in uh, collaboration and networking. Um, so that's just what I would like to say. Um, specifically, I would say Break and Freeze website definitely has a lot of um, um, information that you can tap into and I will put our QR uh, code in the chat box as well. Thank you so much. So I think that we are now reaching the end of our event. So as a conclusion, I would like just to share a quick uh, wrap up of what has been said. Um, so I believe that we have heard what prostitution, uh, that prostitution can never be a word considering the serious violation it is of human dignity, gender equality and human rights more generally. I think we have heard also that prostitution can never be a work in the scope of the international labor law and international human rights law. And I think we have heard also that access to decent work is possible for all and for persons exiting prostitution. And we recognize and comment the tremendous work that survivors and frontline organizations are doing for that and the efforts done by the union to promote those ideas and also the commitment of member states. And we really hope that um, this event and your commitments will inspire other states and other unions uh, in joining uh, our efforts. So on behalf of CAP, I really want to thank you all panelists for your excellent insights. I want to, sh to thank also the interpreters, the participants, and also all the CAP members and persons in the staff who have helped me to organize uh, this event and specifically to our intern, Mylene Tran, who was very, very helpful in the past days. Uh, if some of you are, in, are interested in knowing more about our campaigns, abolitionist legislation, if you are an NGO, a state, a parliamentarian, a union, anyone, you can reach, uh, reach out to us. We will share our contact uh, on the chat. And we will be really happy to discuss that. On my side, I am permanently based in Geneva. So if they are a uh, neighbor in the audience, I would be really happy to meet and discuss in real. And also I give you um, just a short information about our next event in the scope of the CSW that will be uh, next Monday about the impacts of the Russian aggression on the sexual exploitation of Ukrainian women. And we will have the participation of two uh, advocates, feminist advocates from Ukraine, who will share with us uh, what they are observing, what's going on today. And also two of our members who are in neighboring countries, one in Latvia and the other one in Lithuania, because they are also already observing impacts on their activity uh, today. So we want to offer this space for conversation to share information about what's going on and think maybe identify some concrete needs they have and think on how we can uh, mobilize and call uh, for action. So thank you very much to everyone. Uh, as I said, uh, this uh, event is recorded. It will be replayed. Uh, you will find on all the information on our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and website. And uh, thanks a lot to everyone and goodbye.